Lesson 10, Rational Numbers and Equivalent Fractions. So today we're going to go over the set of rational numbers. Um, if we start with the smallest set which we have right now, that's the counting numbers. So we're going to make the big circles here. So start with kind of a, a smaller one down a little bit. We'll call that counting numbers. Another name for counting numbers is natural numbers. Then if you add zero, you get a slightly bigger set, bigger by one number, and that's called the whole numbers. Then if you add the negative numbers in, the, the opposite of the counting numbers, those are called integers. And we'll just add the negatives. And then if you were to add all the fractions, so any number that is a fraction, that would be our rational numbers. And just so you know, if you have a repeating decimal or you have a decimal that ends, that's a rational number. So rational numbers, by definition, can be written as fractions. A fraction is also called a ratio. And that's kind of where we get the number rational. Um, if it's a decimal number, <coughs> the decimals will terminate or repeat. Now we have something that's called closure. Closure just means that um, a set of numbers will, when you do the operation, it will stay within the set. So if we're talking about certain sets of numbers, so let's look for example the set of whole numbers. You might be asked, is the set of whole numbers closed under? So this is how we ask the question. So if we're talking about multiplication, that just means if you take any two whole numbers and multiply them, do you still get a whole number? Would the answer be a whole number? So the set of whole numbers is closed under multiplication because if you take any two whole numbers and multiply them, you'll get a whole number for your answer. How about addition? Is it closed under addition? If you add two whole numbers, you will always get another whole number. So it is closed under addition. If it's subtraction, if I took the whole number zero and subtracted the whole number 10, I would go into the negatives. It would no longer be a whole number. So the set of whole numbers is not closed under subtraction because you can subtract a bigger whole number from a smaller whole number and get out of the set of whole numbers. And division is not closed with division because you could then get a fraction. If you did one divided by three, that is no longer a whole number. It is one third that becomes a rational number. So it's not closed. Equivalent fractions are just fractions with the same value. So 
So they may look different, but when reduced, they'll be the same. So for instance, 1 half is equivalent to 3 sixths, is equivalent to 5 tenths, is equivalent to 20 fortieths, and so on. So if they have the same value, all of these, when reduced, will be 1 half. Then they're called the equivalent fractions. We reduce fractions by dividing the numerator and the denominator by the same number. I'm going to show you an example of a way to reduce when you have bigger numerators and denominators. So I'm going to turn the page. This is my warning. I've got to turn the page. Okay, so for example, if we wanted to reduce 72 over 108. Those are a little bit bigger numbers, not quite. You might see right away that 12 goes into both, but let's pretend you didn't. We could do the factor tree and say 72 is 9 times 8, 9 is 3 times 3, 8 is 4 times 2, so we could rewrite 72 without using exponents. We'll just put all the prime factors. And then we would do the same thing with 108, which is 9 times 12. 9 is 3 and 3. 12 is 4 and 3. And 4 is 2 and 2. So we'd have 2 times 2 times 3 times 3 times 3. So if you have these written as prime numbers, you can cancel the primes that are the same in the numerator <coughs> and the denominator. So 2 divided by 2 equals 1. So if we just kind of look at that as a giant 1 times. And then this, these 2s cancel to be a 1. These 3s could be a 1. And these 3s could be a 1. Then if we multiply what's left, we have 1 times 1 times 2 times 1 times 1. We have 2 in the numerator and 3 in the denominator. So it reduces down to 2 thirds. The greatest common factor which from here on out, let's write it GCF. So we don't have to write out greatest common factor every single time. It's the largest whole number that is a factor of every number in the set. Wait a minute. Yes, the largest whole number that is a factor of every number in the set. Now these do not, of course, they would not be um, necessarily have to be prime. So they could be composite. So let's do an example of finding greatest common factor. We want to find the greatest common factor of 72 and 108. And this is how we would write the problem. Find the greatest common factor of 72 and 108. Since we've already found the prime factors of those, we could come up here and say which ones did we cross out? We crossed out two twos and two threes. So if you just multiply those together, 
if we just took our two twos and our two threes and multiplied them together, we would get four <laughs> times nine or 36. So 36 is the largest whole number that will go into both 72 and 108. So if you just find what um, prime numbers they have in common, multiply them together and that's your greatest common factor. If we want to compare fractions, one way is to get a common denominator. So let's say we're comparing <laughs> two-thirds and three-fifths. So a common denominator with these would be um, 15. So if we multiply the one on the left by 5 over 5. So we're just multiplying by the number 1 in the form of 5 over 5. We get 10 fifteenths. And then if we multiply 3 fifths by 3 over 3, we get 9 fifteenths. And then we can compare numerators. So 10 fifteenths is greater than 9 fifteenths, and we have a greater than sign here. An improper fraction has a larger numerator. So an example would be 7 thirds is an improper fraction. Has a larger numerator. And the last definition we're going to put in is a mixed number. It's a whole number and a fraction with it. So for example, two and one third would be considered a mixed number. One and one tenth. If I wanted to demonstrate two and one third using a sketch. So sometimes you're asked, just use a sketch and um, show two and one third um, is equivalent to seven thirds. So we'll show, oops, there's no E on the end of show. Two and one thirds equals seven thirds. So to show that, we would just draw three circles, each of them divided in thirds. And then I'm going to shade two whole ones and one third of the third one. And if you notice, this represents two and one third, and if you count up all the thirds, you would get seven thirds. So that's the way you would demonstrate that. That's the end of the lesson.